So my name is David Flaherty. Um, I am the owner of the business uh, called Left Coast Bay, which specializes in cast and instruction, um, single hand, single hand spay, two hand rods. <laughs> so if you can go after fish, that's what I teach, I mean, including saltwater. Um, so a little bit of background with me. I spend probably 150, 200 days a year on the water. Um, and probably 80, 90% of that is two hand rods. That's just what I really enjoy doing. Um, we're targeting a different style of fish when you're swinging two hand rods. Okay. Um, I work with a couple of different companies. Um, it's just, as she said, you know, with some of my casting, it photographs really well. So I work with Reddington, Sage, Rio, OPST. Um, and we do a lot of line testing and stuff. So it's been pretty fortunate to kind of be in that realm. Um, within all these specialties, lines to me is probably the biggest advancement in all the fly fishing products today. Um, you can totally change the dynamics of what you have by changing lines. Everyone wants to go buy that new rod, which is nothing wrong with that. But I can tell you, if you're frustrated or it just doesn't work the way you want, we can modify that with a line much faster than just chasing new rods and expecting that to be the solution. Um, tapers, designs, you know, um, which we can get into that, um, really plays a big part based on your conditions, the zones you want to fish, the way you cast. People cast different. Even if a rod's a specific action, you could be a finesse caster, an aggressive caster. Um, that totally changes maybe the line that works for you. So those are things that help modify. And I can tell people like, you take a video, give me three, five casts, I can probably analyze, tell you what's going wrong, what you need to improve, whether it works for you and your style of casting. Okay. So with that tonight, we want to kind of focus on steelhead on specifically the Mackenzie River. Um, it is a year-round fishery, which is pretty nice. <laughs> um, there is, we'll kind of go over, I'm just gonna go ahead and advance. Let's, um, so these are pretty much the zones with this map. So we have everything from the confluence right at I-5 um, of the Willamette River, which is kind of the, the end of the Mackenzie. Um, and most of your steelhead are going to be up to over here. <laughs> the lever, because there's a dam there, okay? Everyone thinks that's the end of the line for the fish. That's actually not true. But I will say that your biggest majority, your best success is going to be between the lever dam and the headwaters that meet at, or I'm sorry, the tailwaters, uh, the confluence of the Willamette River. That's 34 miles of steelhead water just in that zone, okay? Um, there are steelhead that do go above that. Um, the Mackenzie actually doesn't have any wild steelhead, so to speak, okay? Um, it was a hatchery ran fishery. With that said, there are some things, I work with some of the biologists, actually John McMillan and Bill, I've talked to them about some things because we've seen fish that are unclipped above the dam. Um, so a lot of that has to relate to our red sides breeding with fish that, you know, because any rainbow can become a steelhead as long as it goes to the ocean, okay? Um, so there's some genetic lines that I believe have some steelhead-isk um, qualities. And we do find fish. I mean, I've found fish, I want to say ballpark, 15, 20 miles above that dam. So don't isolate that. But I will say if you're really trying to target them, target from the dam down to the Willamette, okay? Um, the Mackenzie is kind of an interesting fishery because one thing is great. I mean, we have an amazing aquatic and bug, you know, entomology um, river. It's super clean. It's like one of like the third cleanest rivers on the West Coast. <laughs> um, and you see that in summer, I mean, eight feet of water, it looks glass clear, all the rocks. Um, so that clarity also means those fish usually have that clean genetic line. 
They have really good eating habits. So you're gonna get some stronger, very pretty, clean looking fish, which everything in my slides and stuff are all my photos, my stuff, real fishing on this river. Okay, so we'll see that as we go. Um, the Mackenzie really is a boat dominant river. There's so much private property, not to say that you can't, but if you really wanna boost your odds having a boat and it doesn't have to be anything special, it could be, you know, I ran a single, per, you know, pontoon just as a water taxi, okay? Um, so don't dismiss that. The places that you can get walking access, there's definitely fish. Um, it just gets targeted a little bit heavier. So you got to play time conditions just a little bit better. That's kind of the key thing right there. So with that said, um, there are seasons. So all of our fish are summer steelhead. People ask, are there winter fish? Well, we caught some in the late season. They're still summer steelhead. There is a very big difference. They come in as juvenile fish if it's a summer steelhead. So the Mackenzie, we've caught fish earlier and later, but this is kind of like the baseline. So you're really looking at April, October. It can go into, I mean, we've caught them into December, but realistically, the last day in October, beginning of April, that's a really good time to start keying in on those fish. Um, they come in a couple phases, and that's why I'm going to go through. We have, I'm going to break it down as early fish, mid season, and a late season. Okay. Because even though they're the same species, same type of fish, water conditions, the time they come in the river, um, all play a little bit different. So I'm going to subcategorize that because I will approach the fish different in April, May, as I would in July, August, or even now, like October they just act a little bit different, okay? So our fish, again, these are all generalizations and they kind of have little variants. So 48 pounds is pretty typical, okay? Most of these fish, yeah, gonna be, I mean, almost identical. So it's 24, 30. Um, I'll say like 80% of your fish are gonna be like on the dot, like 27 inches. <laughs> so it is nice. We actually have some pretty nice, beautiful quality of fish in that river. Um, very rarely do you ever find anything under 24, period. It's just, um, again, I think it's the length that they have to travel. They just don't have that smaller stature. Like the Rogue River, which is a smaller, shorter river system, they get a lot of smaller fish, um, different food cycles too. Um, but it is open year round. <laughs> okay. And part of this I'm going to focus on is single hand or two hand, whether it be stream or swinging or dries. Um, I can touch into nymphing, but that's not really what I focus on. And so if you have those questions, feel free, but just understand this is gonna be a focus on those two things. And for one reason, very specifically, um, you get a steelhead nymphing versus you get one skating or surface take or swinging subsurface. Those are gonna be two different fish. Um, they're all predators. All your steelhead are predators, but something that's gonna take a swung fly is gonna be much more aggressive, the alpha or a wild fish. So acrobatic, big runs, hard pulling, those are the fish I'm after. And these are the techniques I use because it really does separate and isolate that type of fish. If that's what you want, this is the game for you. I can tell you that. Um, there are some seasons where it may not 100% be that way, but I can tell you that majority of all your fish are going to be that way if you get on a swung fly. And we've had it, same run, people nymphing. It's a couple pulls and then they give up. Um, it's just a different type of fish. You know, you can have two people, you can have this athlete in a room and you can have somebody that's fairly dormant. Um, they're still both humans, they're, you know, same age, let's even say but they just gonna react and their characteristics are different. So we can target the type of fish we want based on the style of the presentation we're giving to the fish. And so I'll ask as we go through each slide, if you have any questions on these specific things, I'll kind of hit them at the very end and then we'll, we'll advance. So does anyone have any questions on this part for times of the year, size of fish, the river itself? Based on that size of fish, do you Right, and are you gonna get into 
raw and blind sizes later. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a big part. Um, yeah, it's definitely a progression. And um, you're speaking my language because it's one of my favorite things to talk about. <laughs> Oops. Okay, so our early to late season. And so again, these are, this is last, last year's. Huh. Um, and you can see that's not a wild fish, that is a hatchery fish. So they just bigger, cleaner, <laughs> really beautiful looking fish. Um, so I'm gonna define early season, April through June. And this is a little, it's all based on water and temperature. Um, you really want to know the key to steelheading is that temperature and water conditions, okay? And I mean, one of the best sources you can start doing is looking at like the USGS. And if we're talking about the McKenzie, like I said, most of your fish are going to be below Lieber Dam. McKenzie River below Lieber Dam, that's the gauge you want to use. They have a 10-year cycle on it with these little triangles. It's incredibly accurate, okay? Swinging, you can be below the average. And I'll get into that, the reason why. Um, you know, if you've been out like trout fishing, you know, here we're going like March Browns and PMDs and stuff like that. So that's kind of our early first hatches coming off. But we know the water's still higher than typical, like if we fish in the summer. Okay. So these fish can come in as early as February, March. And we've caught them in March, like first, second week of March. Um, super chrome bright. I mean, it's, it's incredible. So the water's going to be a little higher. Flows are faster. It's got to be off color. We're still dealing with rain that can change sediments in that. Okay. Um, so with that, these fish are typically steelhead or lazy by nature. I hate to say that, but it is true. <laughs> so um, the least resistance travel path is what a steelhead takes. Meaning if you take a leaf at the head of a run and drop it and whatever that travel line is to the tail out, that is majority highway, steelhead highway between that run that they wanna take, okay? So if we have higher water, that leaf that you drop can go river left, river right, in the middle, it's broader, it's wider. So these fish actually have more travel lane space in the early season. As we get lower, those lanes get narrower and narrower and it gets a little bit more fine-tuned and easier to read. So in our early season, those are things to kind of be looking at. Mid-season, June through August. Okay, so this is like I said, it's classic water. So if you watch videos and anything, summer steelheading, you know, um, ankle deep, big wide runs, water's clear. Um, it's, you know, 60s to 80 degrees outside. That is kind of like the classic run for various reasons. Just like I said, water temperatures are up. The warmer they, the water is, the fish are gonna be a little more active, okay? Um, Again, water comes down, your travel lanes become more obvious. Holding spots become more obvious. So that's why people usually target or it's a success may be higher because it's very, it becomes more obvious where these fish might be holding versus in the early seasons. <laughs> um, and then right now we are, September, November is the late season. So a lot of people are like, well, these are summer steelhead and it's supposed to be fall, you know, is this a fall run fish? No, they're just late to the system or they've been hanging out for a while, okay? Um, so this is kind of the mid, almost getting into the later season because it's starting to get a little bit darker and, you know, green on the top and that. They'll get a little bit more color. And this is a really interesting, fun time because it's kind of a mix of the two. We've got water still low. Temperatures are now lower as well. Um, there's a lot of competition in the river, trout in that, um, eating before winter. Um, we've got some great hatches that go on. Um, so it changes some zones, which we will get into. Um, does anyone have any questions on kind of that part? <laughs> One online. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, so now we're going to get some really fun stuff. So, so early season, um, like I said, expect higher, faster flows. That's the biggest thing. So one of the biggest misconceptions, and it makes it really difficult, um, like spay rods, is that they're easier to cast distance. And so you think you need a ton of distance. So what do people do? They tromp to the river 20 feet in, 10 feet in, and they cast as far as they can go. Okay. High water, that's the fish are not typically always in the center river. What they are is, I said lazy by nature, water is always softer on your edges, specifically inside turns, inside bends. Okay. You know, if you Okay. Familiar with okay. rowing a boat, rowing from the inside versus the outside, it's much slower on the inside. So those fish will hang on the inside because you have to understand that these fish are migrating. Coming from the ocean, it's calling time. It's time to go home. It's time to spawn. We've got lots of miles to cover. So we need to reserve said energy to get all the way there. I mean, you're talking to McKenzie, we're already at like, mile almost 400 up here it's a long journey okay so we are looking for soft slow water and when it's high you don't necessarily need to target like i said they can be spread out so there are some variances but i would say first thing i walk into a new river or if this is a new zone for you to cover play those inside edges first okay stay short <laughs> And then if you know there's like structure, so big boulders, you know, something tree, something to break that surface current where it's slow behind it. That's another great holding spot because again, they don't have to work as hard to tread water. Now that's something where I'm gonna specifically target further into the river, okay? Um, so this time water temperatures, like I said, they're gonna be higher and colder, overcast days, darker, um, so you can definitely fish throughout the day. Um, your odds are usually really good, especially if it's overcast and cool because they don't really see the time difference. And one of the most interesting things is steelhead don't have any eyelids, okay? <laughs> um, so people are like, well, why does the morning and evening always produce me in the summer? Strong, bright sun in the summer. Um, not having eyelids, they look up for food coming. So are you going to stare at the sun to potentially try to eat something you can't really see? Not as often. So that's why on overcast, cooler days, it's easier for them to identify food from different locations and your, your, your odds actually can boost right there. So we were talking about that is playing that inside edge. So people think, well, the water's high. It's faster. I'm going to need more sink. I need to get down. You don't, okay? That's one of the biggest misconceptions in super high water. Um, the flows might be, so what I want is a fly that's bigger. I want a bigger profile. I want to get their attention, okay? And actually go with the lighter tip so you don't hang up because you might cast here and let it swing to this edge, but a lot of times it hangs up if you got too much sink by the time it comes to the edge. So by playing with too much sink, you actually, two things, you hang up, or you're actually spooking fish because it gets hung up on rocks. I can tell you, if you're pulling on your line, pulling on your fly, or break off, these fish are fight or flight. Again, it's a survival mechanism. So if you're doing that, it's, it spooks them. They're like, something doesn't feel right. I'm gone. I'm out of here. And I've seen it happen. We do this for North Umpqua. We'll go on the bridge, and you can watch when something's off, those fish literally deviate and take off for a while. 15 minutes, 20 minutes, they'll come back. But that is something to play. So when it's high and fast, I would start with a lighter tip. Mm -hmm. So how many people here do swing or use two hand rods? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can do this single hand. So I do single hand spay and single hand with just overhead line shooting hits too. So I will discuss that. That's why I kind of wanted to see what the market is. Okay, so I'll address that first since I was just specifically talking about that. So if you're familiar with the Mo tips, um, they have, you know, they're 10 foot typically. Um, I would say, seven and a half to five foot of sink is what I use. So I use a five and five or two and a half, seven and a half. Um, that's what I would use. <laughs> um, 
we want to get their attention, okay? Because when it's colder water, they're not willing to move as far. So one of the things that I, um, I do, unless it's really fast water, um, I try to use more sink tips and less weighted flies, okay? I try to use unweighted flies first. Mm -hmm. They have more movement and what I call neutral buoyancy, meaning if you put a fly in the water and it's parallel with the water, that looks natural. We're trying to make something look natural, but get their attention. If something looks off, if it's jigging, if it's fast water, most bait fish are not doing this in fast water. <laughs> Um, if it's like a slower pond or just like an inside deep pool, maybe so. But um, again, we are trying to swing fly. So absolutely. One question, you said you had a deep in the water column. Are you talking the top third, middle third? Low third, mm -hmm. first third. Middle third? Last, uh, bottom third. Bottom third. <laughs> yeah, so again, um, uh, single hand people, you've known this. Um, you take a fly, dry fly, you cast it on top of the water. It moves at, well, I'm gonna throw a number, four miles an hour, okay? You take the same fly subsurface three feet down, it moves almost half the speed, okay? Surface current on the top, the water's faster on the top, it's slower on the bottom. So those fish, they work less when they're lower on the bottom. That's why they hug those edges because they don't actually have to be as deep. The water's a little bit warmer, but it's still, low for that column but it's less work and it's warmer so it's easier for the like metabolism okay great question by the way <laughs> um and that's kind of comes towards the end of that that um soft water so you know if you've gone steelhead fishing or read books articles videos everyone says look for water at walking speed and it's true like water needs most people will say that you swing it, I guarantee your fly is probably swinging faster than what somebody's walking. Okay. So look for something that's even slower than what you think. Um, why that works is because all your material opens up. It has a very slow, you know, you've done that where you take a fly, you just recently tied, got that jet stream water. It's like pencil thin, has no movement, no body profile. You put that slower water, it's like, oh, it's alive. You know, it's coming together, you know. So that, again, is the difference of something catching their attention. <laughs> so with the water being higher, I said, just having the profile of softer water. So play, if you've got an even gravel bar where it's just nice taper and it's slow, but it's got some flow, oxygen, that would be something I would target, which a lot of people yeah, just completely pass up on. So that would be one of the places I definitely look because Unless there's like eagles, osprey, you know, where they feel threatened by any other species, um, they're probably not going to be there. But if they're not, it's definitely a place to target. And I will say that that's one of the problems I do see in almost all your fishing. Um, people follow guides or whatever, or, oh, this water looks great. So everyone targets the same piece of water. Look for a few different things. It is true. Steelhead are creatures of habit, different genetic line, different breeding eras, different age, they're typically going to hold in the same areas. I can tell you the, the number one most difficult part of steelheading is locating them. If you can locate fish, you can find them year after year after year. You wonder why guides are always on fish because they spend five to seven days on the water. They're locating fish, marking all their points, different elevations in that. They might may be there, may not be there that day, but they're typically going to hold in said position and it works year after year. Like I have a spot within three casts. If there's a fish there, I'll hook into it. And it's the weirdest thing. I'll tell people, like, give me five casts. I, I bet we can catch a fish. And it's just to prove that point that they do hold in the same spots. And one of the hardest parts is just locating them. So otter, time of year, type of flies, questions on this. Huh. Tips would you recommend yesterday was 54 on the river? Okay. So the most ideal, doesn't matter what time Ace said summer steelhead is 52, 58. 55 being actually the absolute best. 
Um, you can catch them up to like 60, 62, that's pushing it. Um, I would say 60, I'd probably cap it. Um, for summer fish, I would say as low as like 47, 46, 47, um, you'll still get them to move. So that's actually a great question. So we're talking about temperature. Um, slower the temperature, you got to get a little bit closer in their face. They're not going to move as far. You come out your house and it's raining. It's like, do I really want to go do all this stuff outside? Or when it's summer, it's like, I can wear shorts, sandals. I, I can go hang out all day. These fish are doing the same thing. If it's ideal conditions, I'll make my move. So 55, for an example, fish will move 20 feet for a fly. I've seen it. Um, we get in those lower temps. It might be 18 to three feet, four feet, five feet. So somewhere in that ballpark. Um, I wanna address that. We talked about swinging. It doesn't matter if it's single hand or two hand. So there's a system that's very systematic. I can tell you the number one reason that most people lose steelhead is, oh, I got a bump. And what do they do? They sit there and they cast and then they cast and then they cast and they're wondering why they're not getting bumped. All you're doing is spooking fish. They saw something, they weren't sure about it. They went after it and like, I'm not 100%. Again, predatory, we're getting them to chase. That's the type of fish we want. If I didn't like it, it's that little kid, dad, mom, dad, mom, that's what you're getting. They're like, I don't want anything to do with this. And they're gone. So you need to keep moving. We want them to chase, okay? Um, so that's a big one, is people not moving enough. <laughs> So make sure you're moving. And with that, they say take two steps. It's kind of this normal one. Or if you're still on stripping line versus walking at that point, they say take a pull. Because most people's arm length, give or take, you know, is somewhere between, it's roughly three feet plus or minus like 10 inches, okay? These fish, like I said, like this particular river, they're 27 inches. Why do we do that? It's the length of a steelhead at a time. Otherwise, it's in their nose or missed it and went past their tail. So if you're going too slow or too fast, three, four, five steps, I said these fish may only move a couple inches for a fly. It might have been there and you might have gone way over the back of it. Okay. So be methodical, make them chase, keep moving, but not, you know, and you're going to have to play it, whether it's a little bit fast, a little slow, but whatever it is, keep that rhythm, whether it's two feet three feet, eight feet. I don't really care what it is. If you can stay consistent, that's what hooks fish. People are like, well, you're super mechanical. It's like my cast, like I'm hitting the same angle every time, which that gives me the same speed, the same angle, the same approach. It's just, it was far. It's like, as it gets closer and closer, now it becomes something focused for them. Okay. So we want to get their interest and gradually build that until it's in their face. So mid season, most popular season by far. This is wet wade season. Um, the rivers are down, water clarity is up. Did you have a question? No. Okay, just wanna make sure, okay. Um, so the river, it's easier for us to see the structure below. The travel lanes become more defined. Now with it getting warmer, sun up, <laughs> fish are going to want a little more oxygen. So this is the, the interesting one. People like, they come and ask me like, well, early season I've been casting this inside edge and now I haven't touched a fish in like months. I don't know what's going on. Okay. So they're not going to be in six, eight inches of water, typically on the edge anymore. They want more oxygen. So they're going to be closer to that inside seam where that bubble, all that air is now generating. It's easier to breathe. Okay, so as we get into warmer temperatures, in very warm temperatures, you want to be in that faster water or right on these inside seams. That is the thing to target. Because again, like I said, think of the easiest thing. And for them, it's all about breathing less work. It's, you know, if you take a super warm day, we talk about the Deschutes, you go in that canyon, it's 10, 15 degrees warmer. That's the same thing of them being on that edge. It's like, I can't breathe. It's like open the oven. 
So I'm going to go somewhere where it's cooler. Okay. So start looking at a little bit further in. And a lot of these rivers, I'd be looking at that three to like six feet of water. <laughs> okay. Um, this again, we can start scaling down fly sizes as well um, because they can see stuff from much <laughs> further away. We don't need to get their attention the same way. You go too big, not that they, some will still go after large flies. I know people that fish them year-round. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but it's kind of like this. I'll give an analogy. So we're like in New York City, and everyone's wearing kind of a black umbrella, the black coat. You blend right in, all right? That's throwing a small traditional fly. And then you got the guy in the big clown costume with a big sign walking down the street. It gets your attention, but it may not be the attention that they want. And that's the big fly. So we have options. And because they are juveniles, so some of them that are very juvenilistic in their nature might actually go for the big, crazy, wild clown fly. Okay. But this is a time where the longer they spend in the river, they become a little more trout like. So they're keying in on natural food sources and habitat, but they still want the chase. Okay. So that's kind of the big one. So, yes. What fly size is this time? Uh, so, this time, uh, like, again, a fast to water test, but I would say five to seven on your traditional flies. Um, four on the larger size. But yeah, I would say that most of your fish are probably going to come between like a five and seven. Um, you can catch them on much smaller flies than what you think. Just like, uh, it looks like that fly. Yes. That fish had a nymph in it. So uh, it's a nymph. Or... No, that's a wet fly. <laughs> uh, it's purple peril. Oh, yeah. It's just some flash. And that is a size seven. <laughs> just for reference. <laughs> um, yeah, just with their diet in that, because they're still pretty clean at this point. And that's an, another one. So five, seven. Um, the other one I run, if you want to run bigger, I said if the sun's up and that, you might need a little more depth. Um, I actually run a lot of tube flies. Again, I want lots of movement. That's something that I particularly use. Because again, I if I can avoid it, I don't want to put weight on my flies. Mm -hmm. um, very little, if any. Um, like hobo space are a phenomenal one on slower water. Again, hobo stays in fast water, all that mirror, everything gets very streamlined. Um, if I was going to go something streamlined and I want to get their attention, think about, so sometimes we got to just stop and think about what the fish are seeing. So if the water's moving fast, rather than cutting flies off and stuff like that, why don't I change my presentation? Meaning that the water's fast. I'll use like a hobo stay. People familiar with the hobo stay? Okay. Um, it is a actually just a marabou fly with some amperst <laughs> and just a hot spot on the bottom. It's about inch and a half to two inches. So not super big, um, but they're very light, but that marabou opens up. So it allows it to be an easy casting fly. It's H-O-H-B-O. -O. It's named after the Ho in the Boga Shell. It was actually one of the most famous rivers that it was designed on. It worked very well. It happens to work very well on, I can say, most rivers between Washington, Oregon, and California, just as well. Um, and you can, so they have like green butt versions, like this is what I would be doing, like a hot spot green butt. Um, green butt skunk is a very popular one. Yes, please. I don't have any hooks. I try to find stuff on the ground. I don't have any hooks in the eye. Okay. They're just like, so. I think like on your like a nymph hook. I mean it's really close, like a size like two. <laughs> um, it's just like like A Rex and that, like they just run the odds or AJs, Alec Jackson flies. Um, they're typically in odds. Like I said, you can run it even. So a fly, I would say, is about an inch and a half, inch to inch and a half profile. It's really what I'm looking at. Something streamlined. So one of the things I found in Steelhead, and this is like all across that I personally like to do, especially if the water's clear, is cropped profiles, sparse flies, okay? Um, why the hobo spay works, I said it uses Amherst. To me, and this works in a lot, like if you're trout spaying, you'll, you might notice this, 
Um, stuff with barring catches fish. It, to me, it's less about like flash, the type of color. It is seeing contrast. These fish see contrast. So barring, you know, uh, throwing that hot spot, it's, it's a contrast against the body thorax. <laughs> that is something that I would be looking at doing. Um, I mean, that fly is just sparse purple, tiny little hot spot, a little bit of flash. Okay. Um, like I said, if you're running faster water and all your materials is flattening down, I'm looking at it. Very thin profile. Now, if I throw this presentation broadside, it's much easier to see. So if the water's fast, throw some broadside presentations versus this down and across. So typically it's down and across. And what I mean is throw it closer to 90, throw a little men, you give it a little bit of a, like a dead drift and then let it swing. It gets their present, it gets their attention. A little bit bigger profile without having to change anything. So that's kind of the beauty with a lot of the stuff. Like I said, we could change tips. Before you change flies in that, just think of your conditions and think of if you were there, how does it look? And this just comes by experience. If you know that this water feels fast today, if you have a, I can tell people that you want to fish one, find a special run that you love because you're going to, and that you go consistently to. You're going to see the difference in the water, whether it's up, it's down, color, is it, it's got, you know, algae moss on it. Is it super clean today? You know, do I got debris in the water? Those are going to give you feedback on flows, speeds, water condition when you have success versus not having success. That's the puzzle we're putting together. That's what steelhead, they're gonna be, by nature, they're gonna want to travel a certain way, whether it's temperature, speed of water, and it's up to us to try and cross that path to find out when they're crossing that path, when they're holding here. So it's really good to find, if you do you know, a specific piece of water, cover it the same way, try the, you know, or try like with one fly or second fly, but try to experiment with it throughout the seasons when it changes. Okay. Any other questions there? That's mid season. So like I said, this is, um, this is the time, like I said, 55 is ideal. It's like prime time. Fish are willing to move. They're gonna run for flies. So a lot of times when you get those flash, like, did I just see a flash? It probably was. <laughs> they will move for flies. I said, you don't have to go big, but in the daytime, if it's really sunny in that, that's why I will get a little bit of depth. So think of these smaller flies, more of a AM, PM, or play the shape. Deschutes is the most renowned river for playing the shape. I've caught a great deal of fish warm as long as you're playing the shape. <laughs> Um, again, it's an, a visual thing. If they can't see the food, they're not coming for it. So those are the kind of the things that I'd be looking at. So think of bigger, maybe a little more depth because it's a little bit cooler as the day goes on. They're going to move into deeper water. And then in the morning, they're going to be a little more active. So again, they're getting a little more trouty at this time, not fully. So that's one reason we're getting, well, these traditional flies, we're usually throwing it just on a monoliter or intermediate. So most of these flies are only like three to maybe a foot, but mostly like three to 10 inches below the surface. That's where you're getting those takes. It is, so they have to move, knowing that I'm telling you to go in three to five feet of water, three to six feet of water. These fish will move for flies, okay? Um, yeah, so Mackenzie specific. So everyone looks at how do you break down this river? You know, there's a head of a run, a mid body, and then a tail end. Those are kind of like your classic water pieces. Okay. Um, I can tell you most fish are probably in tail ends. <laughs> it's just the case, the way it is. But what they don't really think about, like that's a classic run that water, they don't really see much on the other one. So one of the biggest ones are shelves. And we see this a lot, like if you've done any kind of trout spade, whether it's single hand like swinging or just throwing like wet flies, that it's that color transition when you go from that clear blue and then it goes into that green color. So the color change, the depth change, where it has that color seam, 
those fish will usually hang on that shelf. For whatever reason, it's the ideal flow, temperature, and I think the color has a little bit of um, concealment to it. <laughs> but so don't dismiss those, just a gradual drop off. So it's gonna go from like one foot, two foot, and this nice gradual drop, and then another flat shelf. In that drop, that's usually where most of those fish are. <laughs> So that is one of the spots that most people miss when you pass up on a lot of fish, <laughs> okay? Um, this is another time because the fish, they're a little more abundant. We had some early run fish. Now we're in the mid season and all of a sudden it's getting a little more crowded. <laughs> so I look at what we call like micro scenes. So we've seen it like when we have like a back tributary, okay? Or just in the middle of the river, you see like, oh, it just has a very small little bend between like two, three rocks, something like that. Um, don't dismiss those. Target anything if it's short. I mean, a lot of these fish are in very close quarters <laughs> together. Um, so look at different water that has these same characteristics. Inside bends, big boulders, walking speed or slower, or a shelf. If it's got any of those combinations, it's really good odds there's probably a fish there. <laughs> So that's something that kind of, um, yeah, the sun angle, um, really important that I said, as the sun comes up, like you got maybe used one fly and it was working great. And then all of a sudden we got sunny days, the fish just aren't taking them. Okay. Sometimes they're there. It's just colors reflecting off of sunlight look a little bit different. So we find this in a lot of other species. You know, if you've done any like sea rat cutthroat or fall rainbows is um, sorry, it's kind of losing my track there. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's the type of the color of the fly that we're going to use. So why does black work so well in flies? Anybody know? So there you go. Bingo. So when the sun's up, everything looks like a silhouette. Why does black work? And it doesn't make sense because they say, oh, but bright day, you're supposed to throw a bright fly, a dark day, dark fly. It's sunny, why is black working? Because when you look at something, they see the outline, a silhouette. That is one of the biggest keys to this fishing. So understand that if things aren't working, use black with a little bit of contrast. So like for me, one of my flies, it's even named after that they tie, is black and red. <laughs> red just has this unusual, it works great in bright color days. Black throws a lot of contrast. It looks like a silhouette. It gets their attention. Same thing like if you've ever throw like sculpin patterns. We throw the red gill plates. It looks kind of injured. So they guts my curiosity. Let's go check it out. Maybe it's something easy to eat real quick. Um, some of the most aggressive takes on that flying color. So definitely don't dismiss when the sun is up to maybe change some patterns. Like I said, Go darker, play your bright color. If the bright color is not working, go with a black fly with just a little bit of contrast, whether it be flash, some sort of hackle that breaks up some of the pattern. Those are the type of things that I'd be looking at. <laughs> and the late season, color change on the fish, fall. This is the number one time most people that have never caught a steelhead they're trout fishing is like, oh my gosh, I caught a steelhead today. Why? They're oversized trout at this point. They've become accustomed to their home all over again. This is why it's one of the most fun times to catch them um, because they are gonna be very similar to tactics that we already know. Um, again, I'm still swinging these, but we're gonna have to scale up just a little bit bigger. You know, like trout spay, we're looking at you know, woolly bugger, sculpin patterns, you know, flies are getting close to that two inch size, something with rabbit on it, you know, um, they take it because they get really aggressive in the fall. These fish are competing in the same zones, so they are going to eat the same way, all right? It's just that they will hold and stay put versus most of your trout are kind of, they got this couple hundred yards to quarter mile max, you know, as their life, it's, you know, kind of zone they're kind of cruising because this is my neighborhood. I know it all. 
versus he's the tourist and he's staying at the hotel at the easiest place to park. So we have to look at same nature, but where are they? So we're going to be using those same things, those inside bends, behind structure. Now we're looking at a little bit slower water because the temps are dropping. So it's an unusual time because now we have what we know is most of the water is still low, but now the temperatures are lower too. So it's kind of this different combination. That's why I'm saying we break this down to early, mid, and late season because conditions are different. It's not high water and cold. It's not warm water and low. It's the combination of the previous two. And I've been here now for months, weeks, you know? Um, so it feels more like home again. So they start eating like trout. And on top of this, this is when, it's one of the most famous times to actually hit the surface. Evenings are probably 10 times better than almost even the mornings. Um, you'll definitely hit them in the morning, but fall evenings can be some of the best dry fly steelhead fishing period. Um, October caddis is one of the biggest reasons. Great, big food, They're pretty plentiful in the evening. Um, the, so another thing that surface presentations on dry flies, um, Fortunately, we didn't video it, but so said fish on a swing, they bite a fly, shakes, pops off. You're talking about that happens a lot. That fish is done. He's like, I'm not coming out to play again. Dry fly, unless they take that fly, they can come swap, you know, come hit at it, miss it. As long as they don't hook up to that actual hook, they'll keep playing. I had one two years ago that rose 27 times, landed on 28. It's a visual game. It's super fun because I know where that fish is at. That's why people enjoy the dry fly because it's just like dry fly fishing for a trout. The difference is they keep coming until they get it. And so once you locate that fish, because it's very obvious they're in the area because they come out of the water, um, they're not like a merger takes. They come out of the water for it, and it's pretty big. It's like baby sharks, tails hit the water. It's super fun. That's why I absolutely love that part. But if they don't connect, you can keep playing that zone. That's what makes it super special. Um, yes? So are you a dead drift leader or skating? Skating. Okay. So like we were talking about, or what I was talking about, flies barring, it's a broken pattern. Um, so I wake my flies and a knot that I use is the Turl knot, <laughs> T-U-R-L-E. Um, fantastic knot, it's almost like a jam knot, but it locks in the head. It's a lot better than like, so a lot of people hitch. I'm not a huge advocate sometimes of that because if you twist it wrong and it gets hooked on the hook, it actually weakens the line right at the fly. <laughs> So turtle knot is more of a jam knot. So if you look it up, there's some great videos on it. Um, when you do that, it, it heals the front of the fly up, tail end down. We use like foam, moose, you know, deer hair, something like that. And what it does is it produces a V behind the fly. And so I am creating sound and visual behind my fly. It's like this huge tracer, like coming down on an airplane. You got those light markers. That's what we're giving them. And that's why they keep chasing because they see this from a long ways away. So when I'm waking flies, that's what I want to do. Um, I want to get their attention and they definitely can hear that. And we found that waking your flies and just make that little V. We can't hear it but they definitely can. Like if you've ever been in a pool and you make sounds, you can hear that like a hundred yards away. Um, they're the same way. It's just microscopic little way of getting their attention. But because it's so consistent, the same speed coming across, it doesn't seem, it's more like white noise. So it doesn't seem like something that's alarming to run from. <laughs> um, but yes, I do. And play with your speeds. So if you are gonna be skating, skate slow, like these down and across, like I'll throw 90 downstream men, I want that thing flying across. Because we've seen that when bugs land in the waters. So like wind is one of my favorite times. People are like, oh, I hate the wind. Playing the wind, we've seen bugs land in the water and they're kind of making these, you know, little saucer kind of maneuvers and stuff like that. That gets their attention. 
that's a lot of times why we see like takes when the wind kind of picks up, you know, stuff falls off the trees. Um, but play with different speeds. Mm -hmm. That would be my biggest thing. Most people think you have to go really slow. They will take stuff a little bit faster on the surface. Mm -hmm. It's all about making a strong wake. That's my opinion. So um, lives in my neighborhood, um, Todd Hirano, um, another friend of Shandy's. Um, he's famous for his, it's called the Little Wang, lots of foam. That thing is almost unsinkable and makes these massive wakes. It's like somebody water skiing behind that fly. <laughs> um, and that's honestly, that was what kind of gave me that idea why that works. And we, so we start playing with different flies. Um, Cause like bombers are really, you know, common, especially like Atlantic salmon that we do okay. Um, it's more in the warmer months and earlier. Um, so like one of our great ones, like Thompson River cats, um, muddlers or like, they'll play even early season. But muddlers are great, and there's another reason for that. Um, like I said, um, any of your foam skaters, any of your scoppers and that, they'll be great. Um, and then, like I said, because October cat is just plain orange, natural tones, olives, this time of the year, it is solid, solid choices. People like, I don't know about the right fly. If it gives a good profile on it, if it floats good, if it's sinking, change it out. I can tell you if it that, because it doesn't look like a good presentation it doesn't look natural again if something doesn't look right i don't know if i want to go down that road that's what these steelhead are kind of like so the more we blend in but still get their attention it's the slippery slope of trying to find that even ground that's what gets their attention that's what allows them to play <laughs> um like i said th this is a really fun time you can play on the surface small traditionals you know large traditionals you can play with intruder flies i mean you could almost throw anything as long as you understand the zone that you're playing meaning that if i've got these big boulders with faster water yeah i'm probably gonna throw a bigger fly because one of them's probably parked there where it's a little bit deeper now if i've got this beautiful gravel bar you know waters like white capping through in that i could play probably just a wet fly through there. It's going to get their attention. Got a little bit of color. If it was that, and they're, ch they're going to chase. <laughs> um, if I got this nice little glassy spot that has that little shelf drop off, maybe I'll throw a dry through there. <laughs> so kind of experiment. And that's one of the great things that most people don't commit to dry fly fishing is that when you do, it gives you feedback because you see it. One of the hardest part of steel, like I said, is located. So if it, you play a certain presentation that gives you visual feedback, now I know there's fish here. And if I skate again, it's like, well, there wasn't any fish here. Maybe they're still there. Maybe they're in a different zone. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna go different fly, different presentation, redo the run, <laughs> okay? So if you're fishing by yourself, Find that medium-sized fly, you know, or play it a little bit bigger. Um, if you got a little bit of a bump or something like that, I would say redo the run, scale down. It uh, that's all. It works so well and pretty often. Like I said most of these fish relax in about 15, 20 minutes. So if it didn't fully connect, it was just like a grab. Keep fishing through. Don't stop. And then come back through with a smaller fly. So when we go in. Um, like pairs, like me and a friend, if we're gonna float together. Whoever's got the bigger fly is going first, unless we're splitting a run. If it's like a small run, we're gonna share it. Big fly goes first, come back fly, smaller fly, go second. <laughs> okay, um, that's really successful. It's great to work in pairs of like two or three because you can set up different zones, different flies. And then collectively, we're gonna figure out what's working today what speed and what zone it's just tripling your odds for the day you know it's like for one day full day fishing we're going to get three days of fishing information coming back two days of information coming back so if you have groups don't try to always run the same thing i usually say don't if you do then at least throw like a different color pattern or something like that because we're trying to figure it out once you figure it out then yeah feel free jump on and play but that's one of the biggest things that I would say is 
play your odds, play different colors, play different zones. To me, the zone, the depth of what you're fishing is more important than actual color. Um, but like I said, silhouettes and stuff like that, that's why in summer, purple and black work so well, just the way they image back. <laughs> Any questions in the fall, since we're here right now? <laughs> when did the fall begin? So I would typically say, so I will say um, just the weather, the flows that we've had the last two to three years, everything's running late. So this is kind of an interesting one. Um, just for example, everyone just shoots August 15th, reopen. Everyone booked first 30 days, everyone's like, we haven't bumped fish. And when we normally do, end of July, beginning to mid-August is really usually hot with early fish. It was September and then people start doing really well. Um, it's just because the flows have been off, the temperatures have been off. I mean, we had rain, it was cold in June. These fish don't have, you know, calendars. They're going off of what it feels like when I'm supposed to make my move. So I would say everything based on norm. So I would say typically it's September, when it cools down mid-September through like end of October, November. It's a shorter, but it's more aggressive because the, the weather changes so fast. Um, this year, I think it's just now starting. And the reason I say that is I've fished four different rivers in five weeks and I've hooked a fish every week. <laughs> And that is because the conditions have all changed just recently. Um, so there are fish around. I mean, when people don't say that, you know, I, that's, it's a lot of different rivers. Um, but I've seen the activity a month ago. We weren't getting that much feedback the same way. So it was kind of that weird shoulder that, is it summer? Is it winter? And the summer got too warm and too low. So they kind of just go into holding. They're not in the reserving energy. So I would say typically September, this year, last year, I'm going to call it October, November into early December. That's what I'm, that's my prediction. <laughs> Big question. Until the rain starts, will the river out? So it could be good and bad. So that is uh, actually one thing I do want to touch on this before we move forward is that Mackenzie specifically, even though there's 34 months in the early season, in the early part of mid season, these fish move very, very fast up to the hatchery, okay? So you're gonna get more cruising fish instead of holding fish, typically. If you're getting holding, that's your weather pattern, okay? Um, the other things I look for, and this is like across the board in every river, is people like, it fished great yesterday, it's terrible today. Well, what changed? Okay, look for consistencies. So if I saw, well, we had that like last weekend, we had, overcast, smoke coverage, and then Saturday it went up nine degrees. That's a huge change. What I look for is water temperature, ambient temperature to like be stable for three days. When it's like that, they feel that everything's kind of normal today. So look for patterns of like two, three, four days. The longer it stays consistent, the more predictable the fish become. When you got a big swing like that, expect different behavior. That's usually what shuts off. Doesn't mean the fish aren't there means that we don't know what we want to do because the conditions have completely changed today. So that is something else to play. Does that go for water heights as well? Absolutely. Um, summer steelhead are a little less problematic with water temps, but I can tell you that, yeah, when you get flows on the drop, they know that it's dropping because these fish are summer fish, they know the water's gonna get very low, sometimes dangerously low, dangerously hot. When they feel it move down, they are gonna be moving up. <laughs> so travel lanes are great. <laughs> um, versus like winter fish, they only, they, they definitely ride that, but this, we don't have winter fish, but I just wanna be very specific with that. Um, they will hold, I just noticed that they hold longer when the waters are going up and down. <laughs> they will stay put. Um, you'll see fish for weeks and up to like a month in the same spot. <laughs> um, versus when it's on the drop, expect them to be moving up really quick. That's one reason specifically like your fishermen, they literally fish that first mile and a half and that's like there's a, uh, because they keg up there. It's not great swing water. Well, I take that back. There's like two really good swings like near there. But that's the beauty of why I love swinging because we are fishing different water than what gear fishermen are doing. 
even if they're in the same run, they're on the far end where it's really soft and really deep, right along the edge. I'm fishing this inside shelf between boulders and that. So we're fishing different water. Again, we are fishing for different types of fish. <laughs> so people they get frustrated, but it's frustrating, yes, if they're like floating or fishing right on top of your run or where you're parked. But realistically, um, I catch a tremendous amount of fish when gear fishermen are out. So don't take that as a negative. Uh, we're fishing different zones and different types of fish. Um, we had that last week. We hooked three in town. <laughs> and we had two other gear fishermen boats that we met at the boat ramp. They didn't touch anything. <laughs> they were just fishing different water. And it happened to be where we're at. It was surface takes, barely below surface takes, and then one out of big fly. So we even got them on three different types of flies, which was pretty unreal. And it, again, conditions were ideal. That's when we had, we just played the early morning. It was foggy because the water temperatures are up. You know, we had fog on the water, great conditions. Mm -hmm. um, they play in the early morning and I'm talking play till last light. Um, evening with steelhead in the fall, best time if you're gonna play the evening is literally the last 45 minutes of light, period. Um, I bump multiple fish in that 30 to 40 minutes before the light goes out. <laughs> um, so packing up a little bit early, you might have missed that opportunity. I mean, go have dinner, go out there for an hour and call it a day. Like it's, it could be that good. <laughs> um, so don't dismiss that. <laughs> so let's get into rods. <laughs> okay. So we have single hand rods, two hand rods. So I'm going to go with your single hand rods. Um, whether you're going to be running with sink tips, overhead shooting lines, um, dry lines, um, to me, a 10 foot rod works better. It fights a little bit better typically has a fighting butt, and it mends better. Um, I do a lot of dry fly fishing off of a 10-foot single hand rod. <laughs> um, so most of my fishing, because I am swinging, I'm wade fishing. I'm not fishing from a boat. Tens, you can't. So this came up, like I was talking about these micro seats. If you do have a boat, there's like this one spot you can see like, man, I can't wade out there, but it looks really good. It has all the key signs. So why don't you anchor up there and you can single hand swing through or throw a drive through there. And we've caught fish that way. So that is something that does that. Again, people are only thinking of gravel bars, easy waiting, but sometimes you can anchor up and it could be like two, three, five, ten casts, but there could be fish there and no one's really targeting that. So don't dismiss that if you have it. But what I find is the mendability on a 10 and the ability to fight on a 10 foot rod excels a nine. So don't, you can definitely fight with an, a nine foot rod. I just find if you were gonna buy a specific rod, you'll be much happier with a 10 foot rod. Um, they're easier to cast distance. <laughs> they're easier to mend, easier to control the line. Um, they do feel a little bit heavier. So that is something to kind of play with in factors. Um, and so for the McKenzie, if you're fishing out of a boat, that's why I have six, seven, eight. If I'm fishing on a boat, you can use a six. I mean, you can fish them out of a six, but just expect that it's gonna feel a little bit on the edge a lot of times, you know, like, am I gonna lose this fish? You don't have nearly as much control. So to me, it's about balance when you're fighting a fish, and I'll, but you still want a little bit of control. Um, that's one of the reasons I actually love steelhead because it feels chaotic, out of control until they slow down. And then it's this dance of, let them run, let me reel them in. You gotta work together until they wear down and you guys can meet in the middle. <laughs> but if I had to pick one rod, summer steelhead, Pacific Northwest, north to Southern Oregon or South Valley before you get Southern Oregon, 10 foot seven weight, <laughs> absolutely. Um, it's a combination of, it's lighter than most of your nine foot eights, they have a little more control. So they're more specific. You won't see as many in the shop, but I can tell you that it is just the ideal rod. A 10, once you go from a nine to a 10, like your power, your lines, your, if you're going like sink tips and that, a 10 foot seven weight is almost identical to a nine foot eight weight. It just gives you a little more finesse, a little more line control and a little bit more fighting power. Okay. 
Um, if you think about it, it's like if you were driving a big SUV, like a Suburban versus a Jeep, they might have the same motor if you had one or a car that's a you know, small wheelbase versus a large one. Higher speeds in that, fish are running fast. You're going to have a little more control with the bigger, longer wheelbase vehicle, even though they're built with the same amount of power. Okay. So a lot of people are like, well, if it's the same rod, then why would one be better than the other? It's about control, having a little more leeway. Okay. Um, so that would be it. Um, 10 foot eight weight, um, you're targeting bigger fish. If I'm going to be on the sandy, if I'm going to the tilting area, if you want to target winter fish, cross over. I want to buy one rod because I don't have the expense to buy it a rod for every condition, every river, I'm going to buy a 10 foot eight. Wood. 10 foot eight is a great winter rod. <laughs> um, again, water comes high in the winter. A lot of times you're only playing that inside soft edge. So you don't have to need a lot of big distance. Okay. Um, so there is a little bit, you know, you were talking about like you got into switch rods, first rod um, happens to a lot of people. So switch rods are typically um, over nine foot and under 12 foot. That's what they'll typically classify as far as length, okay? A true switch rod was a line that was designed to do two hand spade casting, sustain, touch and go casting. And then it was also designed to do overhead casting. So if you watch in Europe, they overhead cast with two, two hand rods, you know, double taper lines or longer lines. So, the action of something, a spay rod, the way it loads versus a single hand, they feel different, okay? So the switch rod, they built the tapers in the middle, the length in the middle. So it kind of doesn't do either one very specific when they came out, okay? So there were some difficulties with some of the casting. Today, I can tell you that most switch rods are actually just scaled down tapers of spay because that's what people use them for. They listen to the audio. If you're buying a short rod just because of like tree height, but they want it to be a true spade taper. What I mean by that, most of them are progressive or regressive. So otherwise it gains flex as you load it or it flexes more re or it's uh, regressive, which actually people are like, well, why would I want that? It actually gives you more feedback. Most of my rods, just so you know, are regressive rods because the deeper you flex it, the more feedback the rod gives you. And then it catabolizes. So it's more forgiving versus something that gets tighter and tighter, then your timing has to be dead on. So today's numbers, if you buy a switch rod, it's not the same as a rod that you buy eight, 10 years ago. Okay, just so you know. Or uh, someone said, like, I'm not too keen on my switch rod, but so I'm not sure. I was like, if you just want a switch rod for length, I can tell you 90% of the people are only using them as a baby or short span. They're not using it. Okay. So I said six through eight. So a six is like a five weight spay rod. Or seven, eight weight single hand. And going up to an eight weight, just one size down, would be like a seven weight spay rod. Okay. Because um, again, it's length versus taper. So the longer they are, the stronger the rod's gonna be. Um, it's just more progressive. So typical two hand rods. Um, for this river, Mackenzie, um, I would call the Mackenzie a mid-width river, okay? Um, there's definitely some short cast, but I would say that it's a middle-sized river. Um, the number one rod, if you only had to buy one rod, because you don't know if you're doing winter, you don't know which river you're going on, is a 12 and a half foot rod, because it does everything in the winter. Now, if you're only gonna be doing summer fish, to me, the number one rod size to get is right at 13. The longer they get, people are like, well, they're gonna be heavier. Not really, it's about balance. You have to understand how to balance it with the line and the reel. The reels, because these rods, there's a centrifugal motion, not a parallel single hand motion, okay? So by having that weight on the bottom, it's gonna help initiate the travel line path, okay? So longer, like I found like 13, 13 and a half, are probably the easiest rods period to cast mm -hmm. because they give you more time. They take more time to develop the line. They take more time to load the rod. If you've got more time, you're not rushed. If you're not rushed, 
you've got a little more leeway. Now, if something's super jerky and loads very quick, say a switch rod, um, your timing has to be on. And if you are jerky at all, that rod will load, unload, rod will load, unload. So it's not very forgiving. Okay. So those are the one of the things. So for this river, 12 and a half, 13, you take that size rod, there's not a single section of the river you cannot cover. Um, a lot of people just like 12 and a half because it feels just a little bit lighter. So a six weight is probably as a skilled caster, as you get better, you will really appreciate it. There's a huge difference of weight between a six and a seven. There's another huge weight difference between seven and eight. But I will say a six feels dramatically lighter. So everyone's like, well, then I want the six. And I'm going to tell you, well, depends on how much you cast. Because if you don't cast a lot, a seven will be your best friend. Because the six is very light. When we play the wind, it might be a little more. It's like your single hands. You got a four weight and a five weight. It doesn't seem like much. But when the wind comes, there's a big difference between a four and a five weight when you play the wind. It's the grains in the air. It's the line. Again, lines have the most information. So a six weight, I'm just going to use a Skagit, which is what most people are going to cast. It's going to be somewhere between 390 and 450. Okay. Most of your sevens are going to be 425 to 525. So it's quite a bit heavier. It's going to be a little more forgiving in the wind. It'll be more forgiving on the size flies. So if you want to play bigger flies, whether you want to cross over in the fall, cross over into a winter rod, the seven will be your best friend. So if you already have a rod, I would say you will really appreciate a six. And to me, a six is the correct size for the fish that we typically fish for. The seven will make your life easier, especially if you don't cast a lot. It's more forgiving. And it has way more variance on the size flies that you can cast. Okay. Um, Deschutes, big river, wind. So most people cast a seven. The rod's actually designed for it. It's a six and a half. Um, like Deck Hogan, the Deck O2. It was specifically designed on that river because he was fishing the river. Um, so it's a six and a half, a six, seven weight rod. Um, and that's actually what I fish. I fish in Anderson for that rod. Um, and it's a, right down, it's right in the middle of a six and a seven. And it's a beautiful rod for that river. So it doesn't mean that you need one or the other, but I would say if you're to buy one rod, 12 and a half, seven, 13, seven, if you know you're gonna fish bigger rivers. Um, if you already have a rod, I would be buying a 12 and a half, six period. Like it is such a great universal rod. Um, it'll play your Klamath, steelhead your klamath size trout for that matter because their trout are actually bigger than most of their steelhead um yeah actually klamath are like four to five three four five pounds in their trout and you can swing for them so something to think about um questions on rods because we can go into like tapers and speed so with you guys casting skagit lines um i prefer a rod that's a little bit slower on a skagit. It's called sustain anchor. It's a slower, a little more weight. Slower the rod is, the more catapult. Now, if you're doing scanty, longer lines, that's when you can kind of get into some faster rods. So everyone thinks like if a rod's fast, if we know single hand, it's not the speed of the rod, it's your tempo and reaction time of the rod. And so people are like, well, everyone wants a fast rod. It's like, so you're new to the sport, and now you want to have a very fast tempo of something you don't know. Or I can get a medium, medium fast action where I can give you an extra 20, 30% more time to do this. And it's that much more forgiving. And you want to talk about distance. Um, I can show you medium rods that I can cast 140 feet with. <laughs> so um, it's not a distance is always your friend, but I can tell you that a slower rod doesn't mean less distance. Please. Uh, medium fast and then echo and i know that rod very well um echo is well in general um for the last up until the full spay and short spay which is like four years ago um all echo rods are almost a half to one line size heavy so i build when i think of rods if you have to call me and have questions a rod for a six seven eight whatever size it should have a certain grain window 
for a true wave. Okay, echo overbuilds their rods. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. Just know that ahead of time. <laughs> so like an echo seven weight is like most other people's eight weight. Mm -hmm. I know she was just talking about gadgets. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, so myself, um, I throw mostly long line stuff or mid belly. So starting short, we have Skagit's. There's even micros, which are short, which we can get into some lines. Then there's Scandi, which is Scandinavian. So those heads, so let's just give a little reference. So Skagit head, standard Skagit should be right around 23 feet, give or take. Um, shorts are actually about 18 to 20. <laughs> um, Scandi is not designed for big flies. So a Skagit is like a big pickup truck. Scandi is like a sports car. <laughs> so smaller flies, longer, softer. Think of a Scandi as a long distance for a two-hand rod, single-hand line. Very soft presentation on the water. Okay. So a Scandi is going to be between 31, 30, 30 on the short, up to about sub 40, okay, 40 feet is the length of the head. And then there's a tip on these. So most of your tips are 10 to 14 feet. So think about it, if it's a Scandi, just a roll cast, you're getting into 50, 60 feet. So it's very little work thinking that if you roll cast, you can roll cast 25, 30 feet with your single hand, it's the same, matches probably half the energy with a two hand rod to cover 50, 60 feet. Just a very example, if you haven't gotten into these rods. Um, mid bellies are 40 to sub 54 feet. <laughs> and that's actually what I use quite a bit um, because I have no stripping. Again, I'm lazy. I want to do one cast, pick up, one cast, pick up. I have no stripping, I have no line management. <laughs> okay. And then long bellies are 54 to 75. <laughs> so short to long, longer the line are, your timing's got to be better. They're less forgiving <laughs> and smaller the fly. <laughs> So do you start off as a beginner and you start thinking of uh, mid-bellies? Skagit. Skagit. Mm -hmm. Again, it's timing. Heavier, slower the line is. I've got all the time in the world. Um, with a Scandi, as soon as it touches the water, I have to go. So I'm watching this big line, and I'm supposed to be watching that. It's harder to do. Versus a, a Skagit, it's a sustained anchor. So I set the anchor where the fly is. And then I go into position and then I wait for that line to turn over. And as soon as it touches the water, then I go. So I have about three times longer to play with that. Um, so I always tell people, you can fish in the summer with a Skagit. And I, until you're very proficient, there's no point moving up. Um, it creates, it's a different amount of power, different stroke a little bit. Um, same mechanics, but just a little bit different on your timing. It's actually less force when you get into the lighter lines and longer lines, um, but they're just less forgiving. You can't stop. <laughs> you have to just kind of commit and go. Um, and it's more visual. So I'm looking at much further. Um, so I always start people with Skagit. So that's one reason. So one of the companies I work for, or winter, if you're having, if you're having said trouble, shorter the head is because it becomes closer to like the size of the thrown away, they're going to be easier. So like the company OPST, um, they're out of Washington. Their heads are, you can use them on single hand or two hand. And I use a lot of my single hand. It's actually a lot of fun. Um, I can throw like on a three and four weight single hand, I can throw size number eight sculpins with like six inch per second sink on it. And it's very easy. <laughs> and so that's what makes it fun. It's the tool that's designed for that. Um, but those heads are anywhere from like 12 to 17 feet. Okay, so again, they're, you know, like 30% shorter than an average gadget. They're easy to cast because you don't even have to really set them up. You just set the weight and then just push forward. Mm -hmm. So the longer the line, the less forgiven they are. Um, and there's some mechanics that are involved if we have questions with that. Um, any other questions on the rods? <laughs> no? Longer rods, like... Uh, yes. Like a... A uh, switch rod, uh, your skin, you could get by with a shorter head. Like, uh, then, like a 13-foot rod, you'd have to have a longer head for your skin, you say. So, so you don't pull your anchor. Yeah, so as you're casting advanced, you can play with a little more variety of lines with said rod. 
Now, a certain rod will definitely be easy to cast with a certain size. So we have this line is called a Scandi, Scandinavian for short. Like I said, they're typically like 30 to like under 40 feet. So they have one, it's called a Scandi short. It's designed for shorter rods. So it has, it loads a little bit shorter. Your D loop, which your D loop is where the line touches the water next to you. And there's the shape of a D, which is your whole line. And then that connects to the rod tip. Okay, we call it D loop because that's the shape of the line on the water as it's behind you and then you go. So if I have one that has a smaller D loop, it means I don't have to add as much power to make that loop or I don't have to raise as high. So it allows me to have this nice relaxed one by using a Scandi short. Um, very specific, yeah, if you have a certain rod, I can tell you exactly which line I'd probably throw on there. <laughs> um, but yes, um, Scandi shorts are great. And actually, um, it's what I use on my trout spay. You take a Scandi short, because I don't like muscle gadgets are too short, actually, I think, for trout spay rods. Um, so it's 23 feet, and you weight them as gadgets. So it works like a gadget, but it's like a full length because it's 23 phenomenal line so there's like i said there's lots of things we can do play with lines we there's roughly like 120 different lines i mean i've got almost 200 different heads just for spay in my possession so there are so many options and i've done that we take a rod so that's what i do i line test a lot of different rods I, and i'll spend um a couple months because i want to play with them on the water and i can tell you i hand everyone my rod and they're like what was that? It is so good. It's so light. It's so balanced. So it's finding that balance point because every rod's going to react a little bit different. So we're going to find a taper that reacts to your rod in the way that you cast. So does the, does the casting style change? So like if I had a rod and I was mm -hmm. like, ask somebody that was a really good caster, sure. set me up with the right line on this. Correct. Is the line they pick though going to then be the right line? For me this is actually, no, I love this question because I can tell you that um, I get people to ask me a question. I'm not sure if it's lined correctly. And I ask them who lined it. So I know just about every fly shop. I know about every person that casts in this area. Um, if I know who, who lined it, I can tell you if they cast light on the lighter spectrum or on the heavier spectrum. So to me, actually a rod should only have like this very short window, but you'll look on charts. So you'll go to a website, it says you are advanced casters A and an intermediate to new casters B, okay? Um, I've talked to companies, of course, I understand it's business, but I can tell you that is not designed to help you. It's a band-aid and it's designed to make sure that you buy eventually both those lines. And that's why <laughs> when I do my class. So the, it's very mathematical with lines. It's grains per foot, okay? So they tell you like a line, we'll just, I'm gonna come with an easy number. So 500, I think this rod is designed for 500. That's your A, your advanced caster. So they're gonna tell you get a 525, different company, 540, okay? Why? Because if your anchor, where it means where the head and sink tip, so the whole head's out of the water. The head's supposed to flex the rod. 500 grain's supposed to flex this rod. Now, if you have too much of that head, which is stuck on the water, maybe I'm only casting 480, 475 grains. So it feels light. It's a casting issue, not the head. Okay, so now why does somebody cast a really light line? It means they're an aggressive caster. And then, so you're a sink tip. So like it's 10 feet, let's just say T11, which means 11 grains per foot, it's 110 grains. So if they cast half of that head, or I'm sorry, half of the tip out of the water, that's 55 grains heavier. So they're gonna go down a size or two because it's actually still flexing the rod. So if you had a 450 grain head, but you only have half of your sink tip in the water, it's still a 500 grain flex on the rod. That's the issue. It's the casting and the placement of the anchor, not the rod and not the line. So it does come down to casting, okay? So to me, said rod should be a very reasonable window. The only time like I will vary that is condition. So let, let's say winter, we know trees are hanging down. So I'm not gonna have a very easy cast. I want it to load quickly. I will go a little heavier because I may not have all that weight out of the water, but I still want it to flex the same. So I will oversize it if I know I don't have a lot of space. <laughs> or if I know somebody that's, you're talking about injuries. 
if I know someone can't, the speed is just too difficult because it's starting to hurt. Well, let's slow it down. How do we do that? You may not get ultimate distance, but what you're gonna get is the same mechanics and about half the speed to do the same job. Again, we can cater with lines, the rod that you have to make it work for you. That is the biggest thing of understanding how to do that. So great question. Any other questions? We're gonna go, we kind of already, um, single hand lines. I'm just gonna like kind of quickly touch that. Um, so for your smaller flies, you can get away with, you know, like especially if it's seven or eight, it's gonna be easier to cast pretty small, lightweighted flies, okay? Um, so I want something with a fairly medium to longer taper, unless it's windy, or if I know I'm gonna throw bigger flies, um, like SA, it's got like the Nadro, which is a line of size, or half to almost a line size heavy. Um, Rio, which is one of the companies I work with, I have lots of familiarity. Um, you know, like I said, I want something super aggressive, so I'd maybe go with like the Rio Perception which is a slightly shorter head than the real gold, which a lot of people are familiar with. It's a half line size versus everyone's like, well, the gold's a regular. No, actually the gold's between 25 and 0.4 over line. So it's very similar on the loading characteristics on your rod. It's a shorter length. It's about eight feet shorter. So it allows you to load quicker. So with bigger flies, it helps the turnover a little bit better. Okay. No, single hand. Single hand line, single hand rods. Single hand spay or single hand? You could just do cast. overhead. So that so that's the interesting one. People are like, well, do I need a spay line to spay cast? No, you don't. Um, out of a boat, I spay cast with my single hand rods. So if you think about it, somebody's rowing and they cast their head, and I row a lot, and I tell you this happens a lot <laughs> because it comes really close to your head. So what happens if I could get this loop on the water and never cross over the person behind me? The other thing, why that comes in handy, why would I use a spade cast with single hand rods? How many people have nymphed and had your rig look like a rat nest when it's done? Why? Because it crosses paths at one point, multiple points, right? So if I could go in a singular motion where it never crosses the path, you don't get hung up. So one of my favorite lines, so you can throw streamers, wet flies, nymphs is the real single hand spay it's designed for that it's got a spay taper so it's a soft delivery like a single hand but it's a line it's two and a half times over line but the length's so long it, it's not going to feel it's going to feel a touch heavier but i can tell you it's nice and slow and i can throw nymph rigs and i'd be lucky if ever once in a week of fishing that it'll actually cross lines most times win but i can tell you you can pick up and just roll cast and you can drop 50 feet, 40 feet easily on that line. 30 feet is like, it's way too easy. I can tell you, it's like just touching 20 feet with most of your single hand lines. Um, again, lines can do a lot of things with your single hand rods, but this is for a single hand. So we can throw wet, everyone's like, well, I need a two hand rod. No, two hand rods will just cover more water and it's less work, less energy, physical energy. Um, weight, most of these rods may look big, but they're actually fairly light. So my trout spay is a size four, four weight. Um, it weighs almost identical on a scale as a single hand five weight, my nine foot five weight. But yet it plays into a six and a half weight single hand rod. So don't be intimidated by length. They're, they just cover more water. You can mend more water. But single hand, why would I want a single hand over a two hand? Again, if I'm playing if I've got these boulder gardens and I know there's got to be fish because there's some beautiful holding water here. Think North Umqua, you know, for pictures, you know, if you haven't fished it. Um, that's why single hands are so good there because I want pinpoint. I just, they're very short little like drifts or casts in there and it allows me to have that accuracy with a very light presentation. So single hands are, should not be omitted or dismissed. Um, Atlantic salmon fishermen, most people actually rather cast with a single hand if they're doing dry line fishing. Um, so don't dismiss it. And the other idea is that you can go steelheading if you have a single hand run. That's kind of what I want to touch on. Um, the two hands just going to reach out and it's going to be easier to cast. 
it's going to be easier to cover water. If you're not a comfortable wader, like I don't want to wade up to here to cover the zone I want. I can tell you, especially, you know, I, granted, I'm a better caster than most people, but with time, um, most runs, I never, unless it's just physically impossible, I can sit in the water ankle deep and cover every run. And so I have clients, like my knees are not what they used to, or I've had two or three surgeries. I can tell them that, well, I'm going to give you a tool that's going to be easier on your shoulders and you don't have to do all the crazy waiting. So think of it as a tool that you can grow into that makes your life easier on waiting and covering distance. Um, just makes it easier for everybody. But single hand has its place. So they do have um, what we call shooting heads. If anyone's done any like salmon fishing, if you've done exactly um, like bone fishing, you know, like I'll use it on that. Uh, but I do salmon fishing. So they are not designed to false cast. One back, one forward. So you understand it, it's especially for stripers in California. Absolutely. Yeah. So they have a full length and then they have a short version. Full length's great for hitting the surface or just under the surface. If you're not sure which one to get, get the short. The reason I tell you is you can put tips on the end of it. So if I want a little bit of sink, you put a sink tip on the end of that, they're amazing. So I do that. I do my salmon fishing. So it's called the real outbound short. It's one of the most common ones. They have outbound short or outbound and outbound short. So the long one is just designed for leaders, just like your single hand dry lines. Now they also have the short, which is kind of like the same thing that they clipped it off. So it means you have to add that weight into it. So you can throw just a leader on it and it becomes real aggressive. So it's designed for big flies, boom, turns over. But the nice constellation of that, you can put in like poly leaders, 10 foot, seven. Most people are gonna say like seven and a half or eights are actually gonna be really easy to cast. And then two to three feet, okay? So if you know you want a little bit of depth, like I said, I salmon fish with this and it's one back, one forward and you'll be surprised how much water you can cover with that. Plus you get rid of all the false casting. Um, that would be a line that I would add if you don't have to your arsenal. <laughs> Um, and that's going to allow you to throw bigger flies too, that medium size fly, um, because it has so much mass, they're two and a half times, they're one and a half to two and a half times over your rod, typical grain weight. So it just loads quicker. Okay. Um, any specific questions on lines that someone might have on single hand or two hand on this or single hand, sorry. Um, sink tips are great. Poly leaders, I say that everyone should have in their pocket. Um, the standard polys, um, you can throw just about everything. They do make different versions as well. They have a spay one. They're just thinner diameter. So everything's about taper. And we know that taper leaders, you put a mono leader, it doesn't really turn over, right? Taper is energy transfer something thicker to thinner, okay? So some of your smaller rods, you get your four, five, six weight, and you put a regular poly. You're gonna look at that leader is actually thicker than the end of your fly line or the head. That's where you want the Scandi ones because they're smaller diameter, because I want my taper to continue to narrow down. So just keep that in mind. If you see them and it doesn't seem like your cast is going all right, look at the junction between whether it's said leader, your poly leader, your tip, and make sure that it's at least the same size or starting to become smaller than the tip, not larger. And that's on everything that you've ever casted. And we've come to find that. So salmon fly hats, right? Big bushy flies. 4X, 5X doesn't work very well. It works, but it doesn't work very well. If you go 2X, 3X, it's much easier. Why? Because energy transfers something that's bigger on the end. Okay. So trying to get a little reference, maybe something else that we become familiar with. Um, so those are single hand lines. So with our spay lines, um, so we've already kind of touched this, but so there's two. So I think Skagit is for bigger flies in depth, tips. They are designed. So a Skagit, you need a tip. You can't just take this head and then put a leader on the end. It's designed, it needs a certain amount of weight to energy transfer and turnover. You can get different lengths in that, they're typically going to be a grain. So they come in like light, medium, heavy, what they'll call. Or more specifically, everything comes down to numbers for me. 
it's easier to understand stuff in numbers versus everyone's going to label something a little bit different. So most companies are going to be real close. Um, they're measured in what they call T, tungsten. And it's grains per foot. So the light ones are usually T8, eight grains per foot. So standard, most people are going to buy 10 foot tips. I won't call it standard, but um, it's the most popular size, easier to cast on a two-hand run. It's 80 grams. The medium is 110 to 11 grams per foot. Heavy is 14, so 140 grams per foot. So people think sink. Well, if I want more sink, I'm just going to put the heavier one. Okay. Everyone agree with that? Makes sense to me. Okay. And that's actually the wrong answer. Oh, I, I know, right? I had to sit up. So <laughs> they are designed in their system as a sink rate. So T8 drops about six inches per foot. T11 drops about seven. T14 is eight. Not a huge difference. But remember I was talking about that based on how well your anchor, part of your tips in the water, part of it's out. So if I'm gonna cast, now we've cast it a nice, small size, that's what we call like a 12 or 16 dry fly. It's pretty easy. Now then we start getting into like twos for like salmon fly, tougher to cast, right? Okay. So if I've got more weight on the front, it's gonna be harder to cast. So what you do is you match light, medium, heavy to your rod. And though it's neat about the most system, they're all 10 foot. So I got full 10 foot of sink, seven and a half foot of sink, five foot of sink, two and a half feet of sink, intermediate and a float. The beauty of it, they have different sink rates because amount of sink, but yet they all weigh the same. So they're all gonna cast the same. That's why that system is so amazing. You want more sink? I see you being confused. Well, I mean, I was up in Alaska and you know, I had my seven weight rod mm -hmm. and we weren't getting deep enough because it was high. Mm -hmm. And I was able to cast uh, you know, a T11, but it put a T14 on that seven weight rod. And I was struggling, especially when I put a, That's just a weighted fly on top of that. So why don't we have, you know, the same grain of a T11, but with a T14 sink rate. Like I said, there's not much difference. So I said it, it, it sinks at six inches per second and that's based on the amount of feet. So if I want more sink and I, it's difficult to cast something heavier, what's our solution? Longer. So what if I told you, you can take a T8 at 12 and a half feet and it sinks just as fast as T14 or a type six that's 15 feet, that weighs 96 grains versus 140, that actually drops at the same exact distance. So I sampled this with a new company, they're called Bridge, they're out of Canada. Um, they're lighter lines. So it can only throw a max of 100 grains, okay? So I put a 15 foot tip, and then I, what most of are accustomed to, 10 feet of T14. That type six at 15 feet, which is lighter, hung up more than the T14. So you want more depth, you need to go longer. Or two, we go into just what we call specialty heads, multi-density. So if I need more sink, what if I had, so I got a 23 foot head. What if the front of that sinks at five to three inch per second and the midsection sinks at an inch and a half to two inch per second? The head doesn't just all float, part of it sinks. Now to what do I have? I've got 25, 30 feet of sink now. That's your solution. Again, line technology. And it still casts the same. It still flexes your rod the same. So everyone thinks go heavier and heavier. And it's like pulling my car. All right, I got my lawnmower trailer. And then all of a sudden now I've got like a trash, big old trash. Trailer. Now I've got a big fifth wheel by my car. They all are gonna drive differently, okay? So rather than going heavier, you stay in the same grain category, light, medium, heavy, or one of those, or like I said, the Rio made what they call these replacement tips or polys, because polys are, they're a little variance, but not too bad. Real replacement tips, you can look, it has a set of grains on there. You call me, like I said, I'll set you up exactly which rod. You give me a six or seven, like six is, you know, seven's a little more variable, but yeah, 14 is pushing on the seven. It's really designed for an eight foot rod. Um, there are solutions. 
And the idea is that they're all the same grains, but they di have different densities, so they sink at different rates. Okay, so that is one of the biggest things is not overloading our rod. That's why rods break a lot. That's why people struggle with casting them. And I can tell you one of the things, it's people lift too fast. The harder you lift, the more it sinks. You ever just strip and watch fly drop down before it comes back up? You're doing that with your rod if you go, you lift too fast with a two-hand rod. <laughs> um, you watch long distance casters, watch how slow they go. Go look at Spayorama. I got a bunch of videos I can show you too. Um, so you can always go shorter heads. Like I said, if we got trees, big flies, it's difficult. Just go into shorter categories. That is another option here to enhance spay lines. I know it's like spay is kind of like, it seems like a whole lot. And it's only because it can be as complicated because there's so many options. It's more customizable. You know, it's versus like ordering off a menu. I've got like 10 choices or build it yourself. And it's like two pages long of options. That's kind of what it is. But typically when you get in a spade, people know exactly what they want or at least what they don't want. So you can eliminate certain things. But what I do like about it, it's very customizable. You know, what if I tell you to take a single hand line and you want to lighten it up 5%, 10%. I want it 10 feet longer, three feet longer. You can't always do that in single hand unless you're building your own lines, which is not very easy to do for a lot of people. But with spade, you can buy over the counter, you can buy stuff that actually has that option. That is kind of the, the beauty of it. Um, and again, like I said, we're just targeting different fish with that type of rod. Aggressive fish, I can fish different zones. I can fish the surface. I can fish 10 feet down with the same rod, same casting platform, same exact stroke. That's why I do that. Because like I said, I'm very mechanical when I'm going through a rod. It's cast. I had a certain angle. I want to, because I know the approach that I want to go to. I can adjust it a little bit. It's a big rod, so I can do huge mends if I need to. But what I'm like, you know, I didn't get bumped, but I know there's fish there. Maybe I'm going to go a little bit heavier. I can put on the next tip heavier, or maybe two tip, you know, get a little bit further. Get, let me get another foot or two, maybe three feet. I can tell you the rod's going to cast exactly the same. And yet I can do exactly the same thing I did last time, but I'm fishing a completely different zone. That's why when you see people fishing, like I, this guy or this lady over here has been knocking them dead. I swear we're doing the same thing, but you may, you may be just fishing different zones. And sometimes that's all it is. And again, that's why I say, if you do the partners, it's fantastic because we're covering different zones and we'll figure it out. Once we figure out the puzzle, now let's match it up. Any questions there? or anything in general, anything along this lines of steelhead, the Mackenzie, you want river access. I mean, so I've floated the entire, well, minus six miles because it's been under fire for twice. So the only thing I haven't done is the very headwater, Olali to Frizzell. I've done everything from Frizzell down. So I've done 62 miles of the Mackenzie float pretty regularly. Um, I float probably 400 miles a year on the Mackenzie. Um, I know that river really well. So if you guys have any specifics to areas. So, you guide? so great question. Um, because I really want to teach on my fish. So I work as a contract. Um, so I do spay contract trips for Portland Fly Shop, Deck Hogan, um, down in Ashland. Um, I've done some work to help some people out. Um, but I've only done contract work. Teaching is kind of my big thing. Um, what does contract work mean? So if somebody calls your shop and they go, well, we want to do spay or we want to fish this river, or a lot of times so I run bigger water, much like Shandy does. Not all the guides do that. So they'll call me because they know I can run this section of water or I have a certain clientele. So I used to run a lot of like high profile clients or stuff they need like repeat, a lot of celebrities and stuff like that. Um, I used to do a lot of that because of my ability to teach, um, knowing that they're gonna get a top rated, you know, kind of performance out of it. Um, and then I can run just about any water. I run about 15 different rivers every year. So I do know a lot of different water. Um, but yeah, it's something I've kind of put in the back burner, but um, I just enjoy fishing that much. And it's kind of tough knowing that I have to give up all my free time unless I went full time. So. That is one of the things, um, because like I said, um, I fish 
it's pretty standard about 150, 200 days a year for myself. Um, I run through waders about every 16, 18 months. I, I run through boots every two to three years. So yeah, I go through a lot of stuff. So if I wanted somebody to show me where to catch steelhead on Kenzie, who would I call? Um, I can get you a couple of people. Okay. Um, yeah, it'd be a guide thing. <laughs> so that is one of the things, because people are like, well, where do I catch it? Like I said, so I'm giving you things to identify. Um, the amount of hours, it's thousands of hours on the river to figure out where these fish are. And so just to give somebody that information, um, yeah. it changes everything, you know. Um, but I can give you all the key elements. I will give you all the different flies. I will guide, and like we probably wouldn't hit all the runs, but we'll, we'll hit some. Um, but I have guide friends that we work with together. Um, just for an example, like how many fish, it was a different river. Um, five of us, recreational, three guides. Um, the fish that we picked up, steelhead, was almost 10% of all the fish that came over to the falls on the count. It's because we know that section so well. Um, when I go out, we usually get two or three every time. Um, I've had a trip where we went, landed a nine, hooked into 11 on a five mile stretch. So once you figure it out, there's fish around. You kind of prefer the Mackenzie over the Middle Fork because of the water quality? Uh, no, it's time of year is each one. Um, Middle Fork's a fantastic river. It really is. Um, you just definitely, fish, can, it, it comes in phases. Um, so I will say this, that with steelhead, if you are floating, I will fish lower water than probably most people. Again, because fish are isolated. I know where they're at. Two, most people won't run their boats through. Uh, especially hard boats, you know. Um, so look at anything beneficial. So early season, salmon crossover. So the um, May, June, July, you get hit really hard on Middle Fork with salmon fishermen, um, which can push steelhead around. So a little side note, if you do fish, salmon, especially on their reds, that pushes steelhead around. So if there's reds, fish are always above or below. If you see reds, don't eat. Not the fact that, you know, the, you could be like across the river, 200 yards down, you're out of the reds. I can tell you there's not going to be any steelhead there. They just get pushed out dominance wise. Um, so they always go up really quick or they just hang down below. Um, and that's on multiple rivers. I see that. Very, very common. And you can see reds develop really quick. And... Usually that's an indicator before you saw them, if you're like, well, fishing slowed down, that's letting you know that the salmon are getting ready to spawn and they're taking up all the real estate right there. So that is something as an indicator, if you find them, then I know I need to go up or below and look for your water conditions and stuff that has all those signs that actually participate. So uh, we're coming to the end of our, of our time. Yes. Uh, maybe one more question. Any more questions? I'd be happy at anything. <laughs> we should probably wrap it up. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, I hope everyone grabs a little bit of something out of this. Um, and again, so whether previous, whether you're client or not, people contact me if you have information. I'll, I'll give you, I'll tell you if the river's like hasn't been great or it's been good. Um, you need line suggestions, Rod, all that, just call me. I have I had three on the way up here. Um, this is something I do because you said the most difficult part is buying stuff, knowing it's not what you want and you just get more frustrated. So call me, okay? Shoot me a text, email, whatever. It's all the same to me. All right, thank you very much for everyone.